Is Ethereum finally getting ready to make a move on the charts? We're going to take a look at that today. It's going to be a good one. We'll dive in deep to a lot of details around this and going live. My name is Paul Barron. Welcome back into Tech Path. Again, if you're in our live stream and maybe this is your first time in, make sure and just like the video. It's you know kind of a the fiduciary thing to do and also appreciation from us to you. Uh, and if you're not a subscriber, make sure and subscribe right now. And if you hit that little bell, you're going to get notified of these lives. So you're going to get that. And we're trying to do live streams almost every day now. So we're back in the bull market trying to get you guys as much information as we can. I want to thank our sponsor, and that is iTrust Capital. This is one of those things. Right now, we're nearing up to the deadline, April 15th. You can still drop into an IRA and use it for last year as well as drop into this year. So you can kind of double dip there. Uh, so that's a, a benefit by using some of these uh, projects out there or products out there like iTrust Capital. And of course, you can go in and self-direct your own trading, get into gold, all sorts of things within the iTrust Capital site. No fees on a monthly basis, only what your trades are, and that's it. All you have to do, use our link down below. below. You get a $100 funding reward, makes it simple, and it does help the channel. All right, let's get into a few points today. Ethereum in the news a little bit. And, you know, we have to kind of start with Bitcoin. And some of this is geared toward the idea of what the ETF inflows are going to look like. This was a fun tweet out there. After five consecutive outflow days, Bitcoin spot saw 15.4 million USD flow on Monday. So 262 million from Fidelity Plus. So uh, you've got that. So the bid is back. And then I love this one. This was uh, a pretty cool meme that is coming in there. Us being Miami guys, we love the heat. So you got to love that right there. I'm going to go to a clip also. There is a clip here that we'll get into a little bit more detail of why the negative outflows, because this kind of plays into the GBDC thing situation. Look at this one right now. In stark contrast, while Bitcoin is up, Bitcoin ETFs hit a record in outflows. Last week, the 10 Bitcoin ETFs saw $888 million in total outflows. That's about 94% of total crypto fund flows, according to Bloomberg. Where's the disconnect? Let's bring in CNBC's Mackenzie Segalos. Why are we seeing Bitcoin rise and everybody ditching ETFs. So this is definitely a grayscale problem. We've seen these record outflows in the last two weeks in GBTC, and a lot of that had to do with the bankruptcy proceedings of Genesis. As part of that, both Genesis and Gemini liquidated about $2.9 billion worth of uh, their GBTC stake. Part of that's just shoring up the cash to pay back creditors. But even before that, Contessa, we just saw Grayscale really struggle with flows because their fees are so much higher. We're talking 1.5 percent versus 0.3 percent. That's the next biggest fee here. Now, collectively speaking, we are still looking at $52 billion of assets under management across all the funds. So it, it, it's still a promising space, but Grayscale has been struggling. So some things that you have to look at if you are looking at the e-flow, uh, the inflow indicator for Bitcoin. Some of the things you have to consider is where is the run rate? Run rate is for a startup is like how long does the cash last? And if you look at Arkham right here, Grayscale Bitcoin Holdings expected to, to be deplete in 96 days. This is at the current rate. Analysis from Arkham Intelligence uh, saying that basically has transferred a staggering 266,000 Bitcoin out of its wallet since the launch of the ETFs on January 1st or 11th. So if you think about that and the scale, you look just kind of, you know, Gant that out, and you've got this kind of situation occurring in 96 days. That's a that's a pretty big deal, I think. Uh, looking at this long term, nothing in the news which also plays into the ETH narrative is this right here. Government now is indicting uh, crypto exchange uh, KuCoin for two of its founders on criminal charges, citing multi-billion-dollar criminal conspiracy. So more bad news for people that just can't keep their hands out of the cookie jar. It seems like. But one thing that it did do in this news right here around the Ethereum and Litecoin uh, situation, that ETH and Litecoin both are commodities. And this is uh, during the KuCoin complaint. If you look down further in there, U.S. Commodity and Futures Trading Commission filed the lawsuit against the crypto exchange KuCoin today, stated it's a criminal complaint that in addition to Bitcoin, ETH and Litecoin also qualify as commodities. So that's a good thing for Ethereum because it could start to lean in on the Ethereum potential for an ETF. And that is the big, big question because we are now moving into April, tax month. Guess what's next other than the halving? Then you have the deadlines for an ETF. So people looking at this as a potential. Here's, of course, 
Another little uh, tidbit here, Eleanor Terrett here from Fox Business comes in, scoop, hearing rumblings on the institutional level, possibility of interest in a Litecoin ETF. Logic is here because Litecoin's functional similarities to Bitcoin and that the SEC Gov, meaning the SEC, may be more inclined to approve it. So possibly something there as opposed to ETH. I don't know. What are you guys' thoughts? That, that would love to get your feedback on whether or not you think there could be a Litecoin. What would be the probability? Litecoin, ETH, XRP, Litecoin, XRP, ETH. Remember, you've got payment tokens here, so could play into some of that for sure. Another tweet right here. This, of course, kind of goes into it a little bit more around the uh, chatter around Ethereum. Let me kind of zoom in on that one. Been a lot of chatter about the ETH ETFs. Personally, I'm not deterred by it. I believe that ETF should be approved. But right now, I want to talk about how I think perceived lack of SEC engagement should be viewed at this point. And this is the situation that a lot of people are looking at, is that there's actually, to insiders, there's a lot of communication going on, apparently. And even though we've seen a lot of people who, even some who've come on our show talking about that, maybe there's just not as much as there was during the Bitcoin case. May not necessarily be a situation where there need to be as much uh, with the SEC, because obviously they're going through this. Eric Balshunas talked about this, read the ETH poll approval. We're holding the line at 25. Uh, I, th I thought James was a little bit higher than that the last time when we had him on the show last week. But they're saying 25% odds. And to be honest, it's a very pessimistic 25. Lack of engagement seems to be purposeful versus procrastination. So that's the question mark here. Is that really happening? So I want to go to a clip real quick that gets into a little bit more of detail around this. Listen in. I think ETH is going to catch a, a really, you know, really big bid especially if these ETFs going to pass. And like, why do I think the ETFs on ETH and Sol and all these other assets? Because they're making so much fucking money. These are the most, pro like, the biggest ETF launches in the history. And ETFs have been around since the mid-90s, um, starting in, in the U.S. So we're talking about bigger than spies, bigger than Qs, like Bitcoin ETFs. These motherfuckers are raking in AUM. And now some of these guys aren't charging fees. 56 billion total. It's insane. I, think. I mean, that is so why, and bananas. If, so if this is Bitcoin, why not Ethereum? Why not Solana? Why not any of them? And it's not only the Black Rocks and the Fidelities of the world who make money on the AUM. It's the sell-side investment banks who love this too because BlackRock is their client. And guess what? Now you can have a product traded that you as a bank earn fees on. There's no way that these ETFs don't get approved. I know that there's possible politicians in particular, you know, U.S. I take time. There's policies that don't like it. But, yeah. you know, the banks run everything in every single major jurisdiction. And so if the banks want to make money on these things. So what Arthur Hayes is talking about, I mean, this is really a cash cow now for a lot of these banks and a lot of these institutional capital guys. And if you jump back to the tweets that Craig had, Craig Slam, he hit on this right here. All of these issues were figured out. This is in reference to the ETF filing and are identical to when comparing the spot to the Ethereum ETF. The only difference is rather than the ETHs holding Bitcoin, it holds ETH, uh, the ETH GEFs. Uh, so in many ways, the SEC has already engaged and issuers simply have less to engage with this time. Now, remember, Jeff Safer did say that on the last interview that we had with Jeff, being the Bloomberg analyst, that you know Eric's partner. They do a lot of this analysis before. I think the question was is they hadn't seen that open communication. And that has been real. That has not been something that's been out in the open that a lot of reporters and a lot of media have been able to grab onto and say, okay, now we kind of get a better idea that the ETF is coming. So I'm kind of in agreement with that one uh, is it kind of goes both uh, ways. All right, let me get into another thing right here. BlackRock's tokenized fund uh, bringing legitimacy uh, to public blockchains like Ethereum. Uh, this, of course, is Bernstein. This is one of the former analysts of ARK. And I think when you look at BlackRock in general, and um, one of the things about BlackRock, I think that they bring to the space is that legitimate kind of the adults are in the room kind of scenario. And we've obviously seen the push on ETFs from the Bitcoin side of things. And remember that Canada's had ETFs, Europe's had ETFs. We've seen this around the world, but we just have not seen it in the US. And once that occurred, the inflows really started uh, percolating. And I think that's the thing that a lot of people did not expect. So you look at that and then compare this to tokenized fund redemption, which could be on-chain with stablecoins, USDC integration, new asset classes, bonds, equities, FX, all could lead to interoperability between these asset classes, which would be on-chain and scope to a further programmability date based on deal contract conditions, 
Mainly what we're talking about, guys, is blockchain in the major TradFi system in a big way of securitized assets. Securitized assets. That's a big deal. And I think that's a big deal because it starts to pretty much put the onus on a lot of institutional capital to say, this is here. It's not going anywhere. We need to continue our process here of other instruments out there, including ETFs. So this would act as the first major test case for institutional holders to experience 24-7 instant settlement. We talked about this so much on this show. Benefits. And then for institutional holders using liquid funds as margin collateral, there are significant benefits to counterparties with increased transparency and capital efficiencies from instant settlement. This is huge. Um, in terms of TradFi, what this does is it changes the game for a lot of these guys out there working with this. The cool thing is, is that you're in the game with them. It's not some custom club that uh, many people aren't part of because you're already trading a lot of these assets that are in this place. So it's a very interesting time for sure. Here's another hit from GR Dector, and this was, good morning, everyone. Larry Fink, uh, CEO of the world's largest money manager, BlackRock, says U.S. debt, very dangerous levels. We talked about this in a big way. He's issued a warning to his annual uh, investors. You know, now he's done this many times in these letters before. I, I saw it in his ESG statement a few years back. They abandoned that, of course. But his statement here, you can't assume investors will keep buying U.S. treasuries. I agree. After issuing 11.1 trill in additional debt since the pandemic. And he said the total now, 33. We've talked about this before, 123% total GDP. This is out of control. This is a concern of the fiat system. It's a concern of de-dollarization. It's a concern of what we've seen around the global aspect. But now we are looking at a completely different situation now because there are alternatives. And I think Fink has figured out the model. And the model, he understands now, is digital assets, including things like Bitcoin, Ethereum, and others that will be coming into the cycle. The question is, how long does this cycle last? When do we really see the difference? I mean, we've already seen almost a 30% run-up just since 2020 in the valuation of the dollar. So a lot there. Uh, let's go into this tweet right here. Uh, tokenization promises to have even bigger impact on uh, crypto industry than spot Bitcoin ETFs. Totally agree with the Bankless team on that. Trillions of dollars existing in capital are just waiting. This is the other thing that we've talked about before on the show, and that is this massive paywall that's coming in. When I say paywall, meaning money wall, that's coming into the market the amount of money that's been sitting on the sideline. Remember, guys, you, it's still very early in this cycle, number one. And number two, it's still very, very early in the adoption of what's happening in digital assets. People are still trying to figure out NFTs, Web3 gaming. What are we going to use utility for? How is it going to be used in these apps? What's it going to be used for? All those kind of things have not been completely vetted out, much like the early days of the Internet. So definitely a big one uh, for sure. Another tweet right here. Just in, Visa and MasterCard reached $30 billion swipe fee. We just did a video on this. Uh, there wouldn't pause, uh, I don't know, is that video going to go out today? Are we going to drop it? Yeah, so we've got a video coming out on this very issue. It's one of the parts. Uh, it's more of a Solana slant on this. But what this mainly is, is when you think about transactions, every time you swipe a credit card, Visa, MasterCard, there's a transaction fee that goes to a merchant, through a merchant, that that merchant has to pay. In many cases, now they're starting to pass that on to you because the fees are out of hand. Well, now there is a swipe fee deal where some of these fees are going to be paid back. But guess what? There's a few tricks to the trade here. They're only going to do swipe fees rather than e-com fees because they know that everything is going digital. They know it's moving into a decentralized Web3 functional option here. And I think DeFi, along with what's happening within the ecosystem overall in Web3, this starts to really put some pressure on to pro, you know, companies like Visa and MasterCard. That's why I think they're testing so much of what's happening in the system. Uh, X Goldman Sachs, this of course is exactly saying, uh, this is eminent macro summer about to happen and it's gonna bo boost Bitcoin and all coins. And we're gonna see this because remember, there's a few things happening this summer. You got ISM indicator on activity. Uh, all of this is driven by liquidity at the bottom end of 2022. We already knew about that. Everybody jumped out put it into cash, put it into gold, whatever it might have been to hold those liquidity liquidity uh, positions and then be able to try to get in some. Most of the time it was going into regular money markets because you get a 5% in most cases 
as interest rates have continued uh, to climb. But now Bitcoin loves macro summer and the fall even more. Crypto summer has already started and full develops uh, post having. That's where everybody's looking to is this post having. We could see in many cases, people have talked about this before, could we see a 3x or more? We had, um, I think it was uh, Scaramucci and Tapiero were talking about this the other day about really what the potential run up here is. Could be pretty significant for a lot of these charts. And if you just look at what's happening around the globe, a lot definitely in the, in the light uh, for crypto. Bigger game yet to be played out as season arrives and we'll fully enter the, what they call the banana zone. Up we go. A couple of questions coming in. Make sure and drop some questions over on the side. And make sure if you like these kind of videos and you like them live, hit the like button right now. Just smash the like. Ethereum might be coming out of its way. We'll take a look at the charts here in a second and get to that. I want to look further into this right here. It looks like Hong Kong is going to allow an in-kind creation and redemptions of a spot uh, ETF in uh, Q2, unlike the U.S., which is a cash creation only, which could help spark AUM and volume in the fast-growing region. So this is another big advantage for a uh, Hong Kong ETF coming in to play. Emperor hits on this right here. The amount of money that is going to enter the market in the next six months will give us a pump that we have not witnessed before. This is where it gets very intriguing to me is where are the investors really looking to go to? I mean, it, you got to look at whether it's real estate. Real estate, of course, has been depressed. You look at the markets. It's not really conducive to the great loan opportunities that were out there prior you look at gold and silver, not necessarily the play that you would make. Uh, eventually, you're going to see a little bit of a, de a deflection from the Fed, which is going to reduce rates. If that happens, the banks are going to start tumbling like crazy. So cash is going to come out of money markets. So wh where are they going to put this stuff? They got to put it into assets. Risk on is going to be the equation, I think, that makes it go to the next level. I want to get into another clip here. This is Arthur Hayes talking about how big can this cycle really get? What's in it? Earlier, you said six figures by the end of the year and wherever it goes later. I mean, how ridiculous can this bull market go? And I do like the fact that you've already pointed out there will be a next cycle. So I want people to know yeah. that we're not talking about the super cycle that never goes down. And dude, I'm already getting the now that we have ETF money. It's a new paradigm. I heard someone say new paradigm today. I almost puked. Right. It's a new paradigm. Can't go down anymore. We get inflows. Come on now. We'll see our cycles. Right. But how big can this one be? I think we get to million dollar Bitcoin, at least like on, on a tick, right? I think we can get there. I think if we really see a concerted global effort by all the major economic blocks to financially repress people into buying their bonds, and they've and we have this little door of crypto open, I mean the bond market is what, I don't know, however many tens or hundreds of trillions of dollars, trillions, right? Yeah. We don't need all that money to come into crypto. We can see it a little bit because the global bond market is just so massive. And when the bond investors make a decision collectively that they don't like being in a particular market, they will stampede into something else and it will cause reverberations around the global economy. And thankfully, we have this thing called crypto. We have a little small door and some people can be saved. Most people will not. But those of us who hold these assets, I think are in for some massive gains in fiat terms. So um, and you get, I mean, I'm not sure in, in reading that clip if, if Hayes meant a million dollar in this cycle or he means the ultimate, you know, of a million dollars for Bitcoin. I look at it this way is there is going to be another cycle. And if you think, and I, even my own crypto pit research team kind of, we're back and forth on this. Is, that, is this a super cycle? You know, because many people would look back into the early 2000s and say, well, that was a super cycle for the likes of all the tech stocks, you know, because they've really just done pretty much nothing but up. Sure, there's been dips, yes. But the question is really, I think, we haven't seen the amount of true adoption. Yeah, it's there, but we haven't seen the kind of adoption that we saw in the early ages of the internet for Web3, gaming, et cetera. Now, gaming is getting a good breakout hound. Now, I mean, you just saw Avalanche at GDC, um, CES to a certain extent. We saw some movement there on the consumer side of electronics. But I think the opportunity is still very short. Remember, the banks aren't even here yet. I mean, you've just got ETF of Bitcoin only. So you've got that process to come in. All of this, I think, still plays into this of another cycle coming. And that may be the one that is the up only uh, from there on. Because at that point, I think you're probably, this is normal transition of technology. You're probably in a position where, yeah, okay, there was two steps up, one step back. 
And then this cycle, maybe it's three steps up, one step back. And the next cycle, it's fully up the, the flight of stairs. So maybe this is your first round. Uh, what I would always do is make sure and subscribe to the channel because that's the best way to keep on top of all this. We'll get into some charts and we're going to go over to the, uh, did we do a poll? Yeah. Let's take a look at the poll real quick. What do we have? Do you believe the Ethereum ETF will be approved in May? All right, so it's edging it out at 43% yes. Interesting. That's a pretty strong position, I think, with an ETF for Ethereum because I think, the, you know, we haven't seen a lot of news on this. It's been fairly light. Granted, it will probably come up to about the last three to four weeks before we really see some action, I think, from the SEC and also from the issuers because that's when they'll start, you know, refiling adjustments and addendums and all those kind of things that happen around these ETFs. We'll get to some questions. Uh, take a look at this. My real question is, are you still aligned or do you still like uh, Kakinu? Uh, listen, you know, I play the meme coins just because it's just fun. You know, I expect to lose everything most of the time on these. But, you know, I've been playing with Kembo. I've been playing with Whiff. I like Kakinu. I've been in and out of so many different, you know, meme coins. It's just fun. You know, it's always fun to take. What do you think about shrapnel? And the gaming sector. I'm hugely bullish on the gaming sector. To me, that is the winner. I still believe this is the winner in this cycle. Web3 Gaming is the one that is on the bleeding edge. It's kind of that, you know, it's the, the sniper that goes out alone in that market. And that's the thing that's going to happen. I think um, Avalanche will most likely be one of the winners, even though we will see some winners over on Solana as well. Many out there. I still like Star Atlas, which, by the way, is one of the big ones. What are your thoughts on ICP? Man, ICP is running up like crazy. I will tell you this. Um, well, I'm not going to say what, what I did with ICP, but I, what I'll tell you is it's, it's a good token. I mean, you know, it's, a, it's a great token if you're just looking at it for an investment. I mean, this thing is charting like crazy. Let me go over to ICP. We'll just take a look at uh, where ICP is up there. Where is that on the, uh, yeah, there it is right there on the MSI because sometimes, there you go. So just here recently, nice. I'm using the uh, Luxalgo indicator right here. This signals an overlay, so it gives you some indicators to help you kind of guide things through. Our market sentiment index has been flying on this one, but this has been three straight days of some pretty significant numbers here. Let's just take a look real quickly on uh, what ICP has been doing for the week, or just short time. Let's see if I can get out of this here real quick and get to my spot. Let's see here. What are we, uh, just in the two days, up 26%. And if you go to the three day, how much have you guys done on ICP? Nice moves right now. 40, God, 50%. That's a nice, not, that's not a bad deal. Could you take profits there? Maybe if you are in that position. Remember guys, you're kind of entering that tax season. So it's something that, you know, there's still some things you can do. Be aware of that. You know, I trust was our sponsor here. Remember if you're, if, you could still go with a crypto IRA for last year before April 15th, so you can still get that in there. Those kind of things, because if you get into tax loss harvesting, some strategies around that, it's just something to think about. Why would Gensler uh, shenanigans stop down? I don't think they will. I think Gary is, even though there is a theory, there is a theory that we are somewhat aligned with, is that you're going to freak out when I say this, that Gensler might be a good guy. <laughs> I know I said that. The words are probably going to, you know, echo in eternity. <laughs> but uh, where is that from? Anybody know? Anybody know the TV or the uh, movie where that came from? That your words will echo in eternity? Let me know in the comments if you know that one. Uh, what is the outlook for Litecoin? I like, uh, this would be cool if uh, Litecoin got an ETF. Ooh, huge, huge. Uh, SEC looking for $2 billion from Ripple. That was insane. I think that this is going to be, I think the judge may strike that down as an excessive or cruel and unusual punishment uh, for sure. Uh, Tess Ella. Wait a minute. Do we have ladies in the comments now? That's great. I love to see the ladies in the comment. Uh, they absolutely kill it in terms of crypto investing. Why do you want an ETF? Well, I think with ETFs, you have to think about it two ways. One way is that it does give people that just don't want to go through the hassle of exchanges and holding their own keys, dealing with wallets, and they, maybe they just don't care about that kind of thing. They're, they've been investing in these kind of things for a long time. It's what makes them feel comfortable. That is probably the biggest benefit of it. Yeah, thank you, Danny. Gladiator. You, you are exactly right. Gladiator. Yes. 
uh, your words will echo in eternity. Um, great, great line. There. Great movie too, man. That's what I feel like. We're it's like Gladiator, constantly where we're dealing with, you know, treachery and you know, great battle. Anyway, more to go. Hey, Paul, what do you think about RWA? BlackRock jumping in and you have plays in hand. Yeah, okay, so we've talked about real world assets for a very long time on this channel. We like all of the things Avalanche is doing. Go back and look at a lot of our AVAX uh, videos because of the connection it's got with uh, J JP Morgan. There's a lot more out there, I think, that are going to be flowing into the space, including BlackRock and many of these others. We just did a show on one, uh, I think it was Securitize, um, the little company in Miami that partnered with BlackRock to get that thing done. Big one, yeah. Aerodrome, uh, well, you know, listen, you like bass, you got to like Aerodrome. It's like the jupe of, uh, of bass. Think of it that way. And if, if the meme coins are going to run and get loose in uh, bass, well, guess what? Aerodrome's going to fly with it. I think we actually have that one on the chart. Let me go back and see if I can pull it for you. Aerodrome, I think I'm tracking it down. In, we haven't put it in the MSI, but I am tracking. Here it is right here. So... Boom, let's see if we can get it to paint up. It's up 17% on the day, so not a bad move. It just, man, uh, trading view kind of slow for me right now. But, hmm, not painting. That's weird. Oh, there it is. Okay. Wow, that was very slow to pull that chart. So right there is Aerodrome. If you're looking at it, it has recently, over the last three days, taken a pretty nice little run here. 19% actually up on the day. So a nice play for those of you guys looking at Arrow. And uh, those are ones we like too because it's, you know, it's infrastructure. You get in these AMMs, there's a lot of opportunity. Uh, is Alluvium dead? Um, that is a question I think that we'll never say again on this channel because of the things that happen on the internet. Uh, it's not one I'm invested in. We, we don't track it as much anymore. Uh, but hey, listen, all projects can make comebacks. Uh, it's just not one that we're watching at this time. So anyway, hey, listen, thanks a lot for tuning in today. If you guys are not part of the Diamond Circle, make sure and get in on that. It's the number one place that we do additional, you know, kind of one-to-one -one content and one-to-one -one communication with you guys, our audience. And it's really the only place where you can actually get a gateway either into Telegram or into some of our private groups, which is really kind of the ultimate of the PBN thing. So Check all that out. Of course, if you're not following me on X, it's at Paul Barron. We'll catch you next time right here on TechBath.